I've wondered if you've already forgotten about Isaiah chapter 20 until I said it again. He said, oh, that's right. We read that earlier in the service. Sometimes we're not careful, my friend. We can quickly just go through life on autopilot. We're not called to go through life on, auto, on autopilot, are we? We're called to follow Jesus Christ every step of the way, to have a life that counts for Jesus. And the title of the message, Say What? Say What? In this passage, it's a somewhat shocking passage, and we'll deal with some things in this passage that can be a little bit embarrassing, a little bit awkward. But this passage is clearly clearly found smack dab in the middle of your Bible, in the middle of the book of Isaiah, not by accident, but by divine inspiration. And God thought it fit thousands of years ago to make sure that in 2024, the good people of First Baptist Church would remember and would know that Isaiah was asked to walk around naked and barefoot. Say what? Because sometimes God asks what seems to be unreasonable requests. Or am I the only one that feels that? Anyone else with, with transparency and honesty say, sometimes, you know, it seems that what God is asking doesn't seem reasonable. Anybody else? Okay, there's four of us in here. Praise the Lord for the rest of you. <laughs> Either you're not listening to God, you're liars, you're pagans. No, no. I think if we're honest, those who have walked with God would have to recognize this, this powerful truth. That sometimes it seems as if God and what he asks just is off the reservation. Tonight, Isaiah chapter 20 is one of those requests. There's not a, even really a nice way to handle it, though we'll work through what it is. There's not a nice way, but it's one of those things you're like, say what? But I find, as I was studying for this week in this passage, the beautiful truth that we find here is so powerful. Because right smack dab in the middle of these prophecies, these burdens that have been heavy, God just includes these six short verses, paragraph or so, of just a three-year blip in the life of Isaiah, wrapped up right here. And what happens, what takes place, is amazing. Remember, please remember, that in the book of Isaiah, I presented the idea that the main theme of Isaiah is that God is, help me, way up here. And that man is way down here. Remember this now? God is up here. His intentions are up here. His thoughts are up here. His ways are up here. Man is down here. Now, we will come to just the beautiful portion of the Scripture where the God of the universe, the God who is way up here, will come down to man down here. He'll be afflicted for us. All right, he'll be bruised for us. And, and the chastisement of our peace is upon him. And by his stripes, the God who is way up here, by his stripes, we down here are healed. I can't wait to get to that passage. All right, but we're not there yet. But this truth tonight, I think, as we go through it, you'll find will be no less helpful or nor less powerful. Remember, God is up here. What he's doing is up here. And we are down here. This simple fact, this simple truth, is still true in 2024. God is still way up there. His ways are still not our ways. His thoughts, even though we have supercomputers, we cannot touch the mind of God. His ways, his thoughts, his majesty, glory, and power is still up here, and we are down here. Now, some of you don't like that I talk about that. Some of you say, well, no, but Jesus as a friend, he sits closer than a brother. Absolutely true. All right, but, but please, my friend, don't miss this truth that when Jesus is our friend, he has come to us. All right, our drawing nigh to him was this much, and his was whoom, that much. All right, we have not come to his level. He has stooped to our level. Beautiful love. Remember that in Isaiah... He has already written down and prophesied terrible prophecies. He has spoken condemnation on nations and people groups. The children of Israel, other nations, powerful nations, 
strong leaders, and Isaiah has been a mouthpiece for, for God and has spoken truthfully, he's spoken honestly, and he's been rejected. In fact, hold your finger in Isaiah 20 and flip back, please, to Isaiah, to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 is, a, is, a, is a, an account where he has seen the Lord high and lifted up. And this is Isaiah chapter 6, the call of Isaiah. And in verse number 9 of Isaiah chapter 6, God says to Isaiah, after Isaiah says, Here am I, send me, verse number 8, And he, that is God, said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Now what God is saying to Isaiah is not that Isaiah will cause their eyes to be shut and their ears, but he said, you're going to speak so much and for me, and the people will be in rejection and rebellion to what you're saying. Their ears will be closed, their eyes will be shut, their heart will be hard, their eyes will be heavy, all right? They will not listen, Isaiah, to what you're saying. What a great call to the mission field. You're going to go, and they're going to ignore you and reject you, all right? They're not going to listen to a word you say, Isaiah, and Isaiah has just signed up, here my send me. And then Isaiah asks a question, verse 11, then said I, Lord, how long? Right, a natural question. Lord, how long will I do this? That sounds like a hard task. Lord, how long? Like, like, when's the victory? When's the good part, Lord? And the Lord answers, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man and land be utterly desolate. Oh, thanks, Lord. That's my call to the mission field. I'm going to go and be rejected. I'm going to go and be ignored. I'm going to go preach, and people are going to sleep. Oh, wait, that's every service at First Baptist Church. Wait a second. No, I'm just kidding. Understand that Isaiah has already faced some opposition in his ministry. Isaiah has already faced rejection. Isaiah has already faced people who have been against him and ignored him. And now God, in Isaiah chapter 20, comes again to Isaiah. And please look in verse number 2. At the same time, of Isaiah chapter 20, spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amoz, saying, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy loins, and put off thy shoe from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. Now in a moment we're going to pray, but I want you just to imagine this situation for a moment. Here Isaiah has been faithful. Faithfully ministering, faithfully speaking, faithfully preaching, faithfully prophesying. And one day, in Isaiah's life, God's word comes to him again. He's spoken about Egypt. He's spoken about Jerusalem. He's spoken about Assyria and the Syrians. And one day, God says, Isaiah, here's your next message. And I just imagine for a moment that Isaiah, when he receives the word of the Lord, at first is like, good, another message from God. That's been his one uh, uh, his one touch, his one anchor point in life, when everyone else has said no, he knows that he is speaking for God. Right? There's a confidence that comes with that, is there not? A confidence in your life and in my life that everyone else may reject me and be against me, but if I know God is in it, boy, that is a strong anchor, amen? God comes to Isaiah, says, Isaiah, here's the word for today. Can you just imagine Isaiah? Yes, Lord. It's been a hard task, a tedious task, but Lord, I'm going to try to be faithful for you, Lord. I've been trying to serve you. They've rejected, just like you've said. And, and my, my job's not done because I still see cities. They're not wasted yet. My job's not done because they're still inhabited with people. And, and you said, that's how long I'd speak. So Lord, what, what's, my, what's my word of prophecy today? Well, Isaiah, I'd like you to take off your clothes and your shoes and walk around. Say what? Lord, can you run that back again for me? Because I did a pretty good job on the Egyptians. I did a pretty good job in, with the Assyrians. And, and Lord, uh, I, 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 Lord, I think our connection, I think our connection is fuzzy right now. Isaiah, why don't you take off your garments, take off your shoes, and walk around and clothe. 
When the Lord asks what seems to be unreasonable, what do you do? Because there are times in your life and my life when our response is say what? Run this back again. Lord, as we look at your word, I pray you'd help us tonight. Lord, this is not an accident that we're here or in this passage of scripture. And Lord, it's no mistake that there's a powerful truth for us to gather tonight. And so I, I pray that our hearts would be tender to your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and meet with us. And Lord, may we just respond simply and completely to you. Lord, I ask that all that you want to be accomplished in this service would be accomplished. And you would not find rejection in my heart and the hearts of those listening here, but just simple obedience and faith. Lord, we love you. We'll give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Isaiah, what do you do next? Lord, why me? Why me, Lord? I have been serving you faithfully. So why are you asking me to do this hard thing? Well, Lord, why, why? No one else has been rejected like I've been rejected. No one else has been ignored like I've been ignored. Lord, I'm your prophet. I've not told you no. I, I, I volunteered. I said, here am I, send me. Lord, why? Why this? Why this? In your life, have you ever had that question to God? Lord, why this? Why this? Why this trial? Well, why this particular tribulation? Why this calling on my life? Why do I have to walk this path? Lord, this path involves confusion. Ain't no one else going to understand. I remember that when Mary was carrying the Christ child, no one else understood. See, sometimes God asks what seems to be unreasonable. The question is, how do you respond? There's confusion. There's condescension in this request. What will everyone else think about me, Lord, when I walk around without my garments and without my shoes on? They already think I'm a nut job. They already think I'm crazy. They're already not listening to me. And now you want me to say the same things without clothes on? Say what? Don't you think there's a little bit of consternation in the request too? Can you imagine Isaiah's stress level went up that day? Come on now, the stress level went up. Here he was having a good morning enjoying his cup of joe. And God's word came to him and he's like, okay, okay, just put that coffee down. All right, you ever had those days? When the Lord brings something across your path, you're like, okay, wow, time out. I need to go back to bed. Say what? Isaiah was about to become a laughing stock. Isaiah was about to be talked about. Isaiah was about to be noticed. Because my friends, if you walk around without your outer garments on, without shoes on, you will be noticed. If they didn't know your name before, they knew you now. And not for the right reasons. Isaiah is about to be ridiculed more than he already was, if it was possible, and it was, and it is. He was about to become an embarrassing situation and an embarrassment. What if you're Isaiah's neighbor? You know, Josiah, is that your neighbor Isaiah? You said, like, no, I've never seen him before in my life. I don't know that guy. When God comes and he asks what seems unrealistic and unreasonable, how do you respond? Is it a fair question, yes or no? Is it a fair question? I think it is. I think it is. Because does not this seem like an unreasonable request, yes or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. But the right response is answered, I believe, with three questions. With three questions. I'll give you these three questions to give you three statements about them and then a few more stories, illustrations will be done tonight. But I don't want you to miss this, this sermon. I don't want you to miss this truth. 
because I believe it will be a powerful help to you because in your life and in my life, all of us will be at times when what God asks seems unreasonable. And we will have the same response, say, what? Are you kidding me? Yeah, I think there's three questions that we must face. Here are three questions. Number one, is God wise enough? And we'll come back to it, but we'll hear his question. Well, number one is, is God wise enough? Number two, is God good enough? And number three, is God enough? Now already, some of you who are thinkers can start to can see how these questions can weigh in on this account and see how they can answer the situation we have. But I want to maybe instruct us a little bit differently in this. I want you to notice this first statement about the text. All right, we don't know what Isaiah thought. We don't know what Isaiah asked. We just know what Isaiah did. You with me? All right, we don't know his mental state, and we're not supposed to know it. Because apparently it doesn't matter right there. What matters is what he did. Here's the first truth tonight to answer the first question. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you write in your Bible, write this next to this passage of Scripture so when you come back you remember it because I believe this will help us in our life. Number one, the instructions, the instructions of God will never make enough sense unless we believe that God is wise enough. When God comes and asks, and asks of us something that seems unreasonable, his instructions will never make enough sense unless we believe that God is wise enough. Leave it on the screen for a while so you can get time to write it down, and let's talk about this real quick. Let's break it down a little bit. I have three children. They're wonderful children. I love them to death. They, they are children. And they grow in their, in their attitude, in their, in their work, in their tasks, in their, in their obligations, in their obedience. So you may not believe this or not, you may believe this or not, but there have been times when my wife, their mother, and their father, me, have asked them things, and they want to argue with the instructions, the request. Thank you. Some, some are in disbelief. What? Johnny, yes. James, yes. Danielle, yes. As every child has. Right? As simple a request as, can you please take out the trash? Well, Dad, whoa, whoa, time out. All right, I don't need you to argue with me about the trash. All right, I just need you to do it. All right, in this small sense, pick any child, Johnny, James, or Danielle. I am wiser than you. Right? Is that fair, parents? And all you are parents, we've all been through this, right? You understand what I'm saying? All right, the, the, the kids are like, why that? No, 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 no. Listen, time out. The instructions will never make enough sense unless you view the one asking to be wise enough. If you view your boss to be an idiot, then no matter what he asks, you will think he's idiotic. If you view your spouse to be an idiot, hopefully you don't, but if you do, then their request will seem that way. And if you view God to be not as wise as you are, if you think in your convoluted logic that you are actually up here and God is down here, then when God asks one of these unreasonable seemingly requests, then you argue with him. You see, the instructions will never make enough sense unless we choose to believe that God is wise enough. Now, of course, you would say for a moment, well, I would never put myself above God. But the minute you ask, what? How could you do that? You are now questioning God's wisdom. You understand? You're now questioning that, that God knows what he's talking about. All right? And you're trying to help God's perspective, just like children do with their parents. Mom and dad, once I give you my perspective, then you will take my side. Once you have my wisdom, you'll make a different decision. Your instructions will be different. I don't need, God's like, I don't need your wisdom. I'm wise enough without you. The instructions will never make enough sense unless we believe that God is wise enough. We disagree. 
because we have a different perspective, we think, than God. And we do have a different perspective. It's inferior, it's small and limited. And his perspective is wide and large and magnificent. We argue because we think we have a better way, but we don't. In our life, there are times that God will ask us things that don't seem reasonable. He says things like this, I want you to tithe. Say what? God, I can't pay my bills right now. So how can I do that? You're not wise enough. Or God, obviously, you've never had to sacrifice anything. A little tongue in cheek, you with me so far? He asks us to forgive those who hurt us and pray for them. Say what? God, do you know what that person said to me? Do you know what they did to me? They ruined my life. No, they didn't. Who's the author of life? Who? Who's the author of life? God. God. He says, forgive. Even as I've forgiven you. Oh, God. Obviously, when you have my perspective, God, then you understand that I shouldn't have to forgive them. Because, God, you've never had to forgive anybody. God says, I want you to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Or say no to your flesh. Say what? Say no to my desires and my, and my base urges? God, the urges are too strong. They're like other people can say no, but I can't say no. And God, if you have my perspective, then you would say, well, everyone else can say no, but you don't have to say no. Obviously, God, because you've never had any real temptation. God says, I want you to love unconditionally. Unconditionally, Lord? Like without anything in return? When people reject and rebel and still love them? God, you've obviously never sat in my seat. I'm going to get walked all over. God, you've obviously never had to really love like that. You see, the instructions from God will never make enough sense unless we believe that God is wise enough. Here's a verse. Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out. You know what the Bible says in Romans? That God's wisdom, we cannot locate. We can't even obtain it. It is unsearchable. He gives us a glimpse of his wisdom here in the book. And, and it works. It's profitable for life. You follow, it'll bring you to eternal life. But God's wisdom is so vast, it is unsearchable. God's wisdom is enough for our life. There's a man driving down the road, his truck on a steep, narrow mountain road. Missed the turn, truck flipped over, threw him out of the truck, and he somehow managed to grab onto the bush over a 500-foot canyon. Desperate for life and desperately saved, he begins to cry out, help me, help me, realizing no one's around to begin to pray, Lord, help me, Lord, help me. And just a story, God answered Thunderous voice rained down, let go of the bush, I'll catch you. And this man, like many of us in life, looked back up at heaven and said, is there anybody else up there? Now just a story, but how true is that in life? Instructions of God will never, will never be enough if we don't view God to be wise enough. Number two. This is amazing in this passage. Look at this. Uh, please look in verse, uh, in verse number three. And the Lord said, Like, as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptian prisoners and the Ethiopians captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered, to the shame of Egypt." 
Now, verse number three gives to us the explanation for God's request. This is powerful. Please don't miss this. Because how many times in life have you tried to figure out what God is doing? Thinking that if you just understood what God is doing, then you'd be okay with the situation. Are you with me? You're like, I wonder what God, all of us fall prey to this thought process. Something happens like, man, I wonder what God is doing. Someone close to us perhaps passes. We're like, you know what? God is probably trying to get someone so safe. And we try, to, we try to reconcile and explain the situation. All right, thinking falsely that if we know the reasoning, then we'll be okay with the situation. And here in Isaiah chapter 20, God gives to Isaiah the explanation. This is the explanation, Isaiah. You walked around for three years, naked and barefoot, so that Egypt and Ethiopia could be warned. I don't like your explanation, Lord. I think that's a stupid reason. I'm being facetious, I hope you realize, right? Come on, come, come, come. Wouldn't you want something a little bit more in depth if, you, if you're following the Lord? Let's come on now. Wake up here. Wouldn't you want something else? Wouldn't you want to know that what you've done, what you've gone through that's unreasonable would just change the universe? Isaiah, as you've walked three years... My angels have been battling the forces of evil. They have overthrown the, the wicked one in Egypt and in Ethiopia. And there's revival going on, Isaiah. There are thousands, yea, millions being touched by the gospel, Isaiah, because you walked for three years. Isaiah, for the nations of the world will be united under worship for me because you walked for three years. That's the reason we want. And God said, you're just an example there, big guy. Say What? That's why I walked on without clothes on, without shoes on. Here's number two. Not only will the instructions won't be good enough, the explanations will never be good enough unless we believe that God is good enough. They never will be in life. You think that if you don't think God is good enough and you're Job, that God says, Job, by the way, there's a little bit of battle between me and Satan. Thankfully, I was once again right and you stayed faithful. Thanks for suffering all that for me. You think if Job was in a bad place with the Lord, he'd be like, oh, that makes sense. Thank the Lord. Appreciate that. I don't even miss my children you took now. No, the explanation will never be enough unless you view God to be good enough. If God is good enough, then whatever he says is fine. Oh, Lord, that's the reason? Wow, this is great. Let's go back to children. Children, it's bedtime. What? Say what? Well, kids, you need your sleep. <laughs> no, we don't, Mom and Dad. <laughs> we are raring to go. You see, when kids don't view their parents to be good enough, the explanations will never be good enough. And you and I think in our life that if God would just let, if we could just know what God is doing, if we could just know the reasoning, boy, then we could really endure the temptation. We could endure the trial. We could walk that path. We'd be just fine if God just told us what was going on. And it won't be enough unless you view God to be good enough. Then whatever he says, if he's good enough, whatever he says is good enough. Sometimes we'll go somewhere and the kids will ask, where are we going, Dad? I'm not going to tell you. When they were younger, it really kind of frustrated them. They were anxious to know. Like we all are, curiosity killed the cat and caused many consternations in the Howell household. They've learned over the years. They've learned that if I'm doing that, then we're probably going somewhere pretty, pretty nice. Or in essence... They view me to be good enough so they don't worry. Do you view God to be good enough? Do you view God to be good enough or do you question his character? Because God is good. When you sit there and say, why me? Why now? Why so long? Why my child? Why this loved one? Why this test? Why right now? Why this timing? When we do that, we're saying in essence, God, you aren't good enough. You're not good enough. God's goodness, his character, involves two aspects. The verse on the screen for us, Psalm 119.68. Thou art good. 
That's his character. God is good. God is what? Good. And the other part of his character in his aspect, and doest good. God is good, and he does good. God is good enough. He is good. He can't do anything but good, and what he does is good, and the Bible breaks it down real easy for us. If we can answer the question, God is good enough, then the explanation will be just fine. So we come to the last point, and we'll be done tonight. Our instructions will never be enough unless we view God to be enough. Our explanations will never be enough unless God is wise enough. And number three, our obedience will never be enough unless God is enough. God says, Isaiah, that's what I want you to do. Now, I want you to remember the sermon tonight, not because of me. Because I believe, I think, I think you can start, start to connect the dots. This is real life stuff now. When God has something hard. But God said, Isaiah, take off your shoes. Walk barefoot. You're getting nervous now, aren't you? Some of you thought, why did I come to church tonight? Tonight, you won't forget this message. Get a t-shirt on. I'm not going any further. <laughs> Understand something. Some people want to say that Isaiah may have been partially clothed or he may have been completely naked or just with his underwear on. Either way, that's embarrassing. You're naked or underwear, either way, you're embarrassed. I want you to notice something in verse number three. That you probably missed, or maybe missed. And the Lord said, like as my servant Isaiah. What's the next two words? Help me, what does it say? What is it? Nice and loud. Half walked. Present tense, current tense, or past tense. So Isaiah didn't get any of this till, till the end. For three years, all he had was Isaiah walk around naked and barefoot. For three years. Three years, Isaiah didn't get anything. Don't you think at some point you're thinking, Lord, Lord, is this the rest of my life? Is this five years? Is this ten years? Like you have thought in life as well. Lord, will this ever end? Lord, will this ever stop? But Isaiah knew something that we have to know, that God was enough. Because back in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his glory filled the temple. And I said, I am unworthy. I'm a man of unclean lips. lips. 
Isaiah interacted with God, and Isaiah walked away saying, God, you are enough. And our obedience will never be enough unless God is enough. If he's not enough, then we're just a bunch of Pharisees. When he is enough, then we have these verses. Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. God is enough. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, If ye love me, keep my commandments. When God asks what seems unreasonable, the response must simply be to trust and obey. His instructions will be enough if you trust and obey. His explanation, if he gives one, will be enough if we trust and obey. And our obedience will be pleasing if we trust and obey. A little story told. It's a well-worn illustration, but I thought fitting for tonight of the daddy who loved his little girl. And on her fifth birthday, his daddy gave his little girl a beautiful pearl, wax pearl necklace. Little girl wore the necklace everywhere, to school, to church, at home, around the house. The only place she couldn't wear it to was bed because her parents thought it would be a hazard. For five years, this girl was inseparable from this necklace. Home, church, to the grocery store, around the house, inside, outside. On her 10th birthday, her dad came to her and said, Honey, do you love me? Daddy, you know I love me. Uh, you know I love you. Then, honey, I want you to give me a necklace. Daddy, you gave this to me when I was five. Daddy, you know that I wear it all over the place. This was a beautiful gift from you. Daddy, I love you so much, but I can't give you my necklace. Honey, if you love me, I want you to give me the necklace. Oh, Daddy, please, you know how much I love you. You know how I love to hug you. And every time I put this necklace on, I think of how much you love me. Daddy, please, honey, if you love me, give me the necklace. And with tears streaming down her little face, with sobs racking her little body, she gingerly unclasped that cheap pearl necklace from her neck and put it into the hand of her father. And then her father reached behind his back, pulled out a little box. And as the little girl opened the little box, she opened up a beautiful, real pearl necklace. Just a story, one that you could probably quote and change as easily as I can. But what a profound truth that our obedience will never be enough unless God is enough. Then whatever God asks, okay, Lord, if that's what you want, I'll give it to you. If that's what you ask, I'll do it. Because short of that, his instructions will never be good enough. And his explanation will never be good enough unless he is enough. So tonight, if God is not enough, then come back to him as someone who's down here and draw nigh to the God who's up here and he promises to draw nigh to you. And when you taste, you'll find out that he's enough and he's good. Thank you.